This is chapter number five, the age of industrialization. We are discussing the age of industrialization. Now here is the industrialization. What does it mean? Industrialization because the word contain industries. So does it mean industries only or factories only? First, we have to understand what was going on in the in that period. First of all, this is a famous picture in 1900. A popular music publisher, E. T. Paul, produced a music book, and the cover page, the cover page, is announcing that the dawn of the century. So this is showing. This is the cover page, dawn of the century. Now, this picture shows many things. First is. It's a goddess-like figure, uh, the angel of progress, and she is bearing the flag of century, that is the new century. And also she is on a wheel, and this wheel with wings, that shows the time. So her flight is taking into new era, that is new time, new period. And also her flight is uh, taking her to the future with what is behind her? signs of progress these are the signs of progress and these are nothing but railway camera machines printing press and factories this is the one picture but there is one more picture now the one the more thing developed the picture showed a, the differences so this is a picture showing showing you the difference between a magician he is shown like Aladdin and he is claiming or he is making these stuff using the these uh, you can say magics. But here is a picture of a man working hard to build, build all these. So there is a difference and this difference can be, can be assumed or thought to be the different ideas the western people have with as against to the other other region that is orient the glorification as you saw the machines and technology uh, as you saw in the picture it it shows two magicians the one at the top is aladdin as you just saw from the orient now what is this orient the country to the east of mediterranean that is asian people asian countries and the other was the western so this Asian was considered by the Western as pre-modern, traditional and mysterious. So this Aladdin is representing the Orient. And he is making a beautiful palace with the magic lamp he has in his hands. But this one, as I said, this is a mechanic. He is a mechanic. And he has all the modern tools. And he is creating magic like he is building the bridges. This is a bridge. This is a ship, the towers, the high-rise buildings. So, Aladdin is uh, the east and the past, representing east and the past, while this guy is representing the west and the modernity. So, this, these are technological advances. You can understand that the history of industrialization is the progress, technological progress. but we need to ask questions that does this rapid, rapid industrialization is the only measure of progress and modernity does this high rise buildings and bridges is the development that is actually the society is developing how these two pictures i showed came into being why the glorification of mechanic and all these he ma is making so, in order to answer these kind of questions, we have to go back to the history of industrialization. Industries where the products are being made for the consumers and consumers are who? We are the consumers. So, what we will do here is, we will divide the discussion in two parts. First, we will talk about Britain. This is the, why Britain? Because the Britain is the first industrial nation. And then we will talk about India because India was under colonial rule. 
so what happened to the countries which were in colonial rule and india also lies at the orient that is the asian part so we'll try to find out the difference with this picture uh, what exactly it wanted to show we'll understand by that so before the industrial revolution that means industrial revolution people only think or we only think that okay factories were there factories were being established and uh, various industries were established and this is how industrial revolution took place but there was before this industrial revolution things were going on that is a word i'm going to tell you this is proto industrialization proto industrialization so there was a large scale industrial production for an international market which was not based on factories please understand there were no factories but there was still still production and it was controlled by merchants and the goods were produced by vast numbers of producer working within their family farms and not in factories so in 17th and 18th centuries what happened merchants from towns of europe they started moving to the countryside they were supplying money to peasants and artisans and just persuading them requesting them to produce for an international market uh, so that it can be exported merchants they were they were advanced they were offering advances for producing cloths for them at a time when open fields were disappearing as you understand or as you know there were area of commons where people or the you can say the british people can get their uh, way of living but because this common area was not there open fields were disappearing and commons were being enclosed by the by the big landlords you can say so income from this proto industrial production it supplemented the shrinking income from the cultivation of this if you, this uh, picture shows this is a picture of a countryside there are three people who are working together for spinning they are making the threads and these thread because they have a small land now they can cultivate also on this small land but that is not sufficient so th that why they are they are working on this also so they are they are in countryside they are taking care of their uh, land and also making money or little bit of money by doing this why why this was uh, why these people because the question should arise that why merchants were going to the town the merchants were not going to the town but they were going to the countryside the reason was there were urban crafts and trade guilds means in simple word there were already organization which were properly established or you can say associations so association of producers they have certain tasks that is the train craft craftsmen they also maintain control over the production and they also regulated the competition and prices and the most important thing is any person like me if i want to come into this business you the guild person will stop me you will not allow me to enter so what do i do i cannot enter the 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 market because you are stopping me and also the rulers the people who are ruling they are saying that okay these you have to talk to these guild people association people then only you can enter but i can't enter so what do i do i go to the countryside because the export was going on and i have to do something to make these uh, say cloth or yarn right so this all happened and uh, if you see at this there was a very close uh, relationship which developed between the town and the countryside why because the merchants they they were living in town they were based on town but the work they were distributing to the country people so they have to come to the countryside a merchant you see the 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 chakra or wheel the merchant clothier in england purchased wool from wood stapler that is stapler who staples or sort wool according to its fiber and carrier or carry it to spinners those are the people in the countryside that is the yarn thread this spun uh, was spun was taken into subsequent stages of production to weaver fullers and then again to 
to color them to the dyers. Finishing was done in London and then it was being sent to the international market. So one thing you need to understand that London was known as the finishing center. This question may come in one marks. London may, is the finishing center. So this is how there were merchants, they were having so many workers to, with them. So this is how work was going on and this was known as the proto-industrialization because the factory were not there but still the industrialization, industrialization or industries were going on. The production was there that is why it was proto that is it was not there but still it was there. Then uh, the coming up of, of the factory. Here if you see in 1730s the earliest factory in England came up and the first symbol of era was cotton. The thing started was cotton and invention in the 18th century increased the efficacy of each step of production like carding, twisting, spinning, rolling and the output per worker was also rising. And then came Richard Arkwright. He invented the cotton mill and mill production of cotton started which allowed a more careful supervision over the production process. So cotton became the leading sector in the first phase of industrialization. So as I just uh, you know, mentioned that the earliest factory came up in 1730s but late 18th century only the factories multiplied and the cotton was the first symbol and by 1760 it was 2.5 millions which was uh, means Britain was importing this much of raw cotton but by 1787 because of the factorization or factories were so many uh, establishing the import went up to 22 million pounds 22 million pounds so the the reason was because the inventions were was going on the inventions increased the efficiency or efficacy of the production process and also the worker are going a single worker is producing more because of the inventions richard arkwright he created the cotton mill this this question is very important richard arkwright he created the cotton mill and then if if you see the machines when they were uh, there so the production also increased that is mill production of cotton started which and when the mill was there now the in under in one, only one building see this is a building so in just one one building there is one person who can take care of everything what he can take care a careful supervision what is the production process going on that is he can supervise the production process also see the quality whether the content is good or not and the regulation of labor also whether the labor is doing proper work or not these all things were very difficult while the proto industrialization was there that is the thing were going on in the countryside things were changing technology was being used but not that much but people were very very dazzled by these uh, if you see this picture why they were dazzled this is the industrial manchester and if you see so many chimneys with smoke smoke and all these were very new for the british people then the pace of industrial change the expansion of railways in england and its colonies rapidly increased the demand of iron and steel. So the new technologically or technological advancement or ad technologically advanced industrial sectors could not easily displace the traditional industries. They were still there. So textiles were still produced with domestic units and not so much in factories. The high cost of machines and the uncertainty of their performance made technological changes quite slow and merchants and industri industrialists they were very cautious about accepting and using the new technology so in 1781 if, if i can give you an example james watt improved the steam engine produced by new common new common made it and then james watt uh, improved it and patented it also but still there were no buyers or there were less buyers so just uh, to give in a, a detail of this that how rapid was the process of industrialization and this does this industrialization mean only the growth of factories and industries there is a question 
that does this industrialization only means the growth of factory or industries we need to answer this question first of all the clearly cotton was the main thing the dynamic industry most dynamic industry and cotton was you know the leading sector in the first phase of in industrialization so in the first phase of industrialization what was the main thing main was cotton up to 1840s but because of the expansion of the railways that is in england 1840s and then in colonies from the 1860s so now a railway is expanding for railway what is required iron steel iron steel is required so this industry boomed by 1873 britain was exporting iron and steel which was worth this 77 million british currency at that time that is double the the value of cotton export as i said cotton was there but now the shift was there the export was more of iron and steel the second uh, idea which we can take for after answering or you can say for answering this question the second thing is that the new industries were not very were at that time what not very able or it was not displacing the traditional industries only 20% of the total workforce was working uh, in the industrial sector others were still working as in the domestic units the third is the change in the traditional industries was not uh, set by steam powered cotton or metal industries that is they st still remain entirely stagnant stagnant either what does this mean is that there were small innovations and invention in the other sectors also that is only machine and only factory production was was that was there but there were other also non mechanized sector that is always you don't need mechanization you don't need need industries like food processing building pottery glass work tanning furniture making and production of implements all these they also have some innovation so this was also going on so third reason was this and the final reason was the technological changes people accepted and it occurred very slowly that is the machines uh, the inventors and manufacturers were manufacturers were claiming that machine is very good and uh, but it broke down and repair was very costly so the even the rich industrialists they were very cautious about using them they were not just buying it uh, blindfolded i'll just give you an example of steam engine steam engine is one of the most important invention of the modern world it was being produced by neo common but it was being Im improved by james watt this is a very important question neo common made it but james watt improved it and then james watt patented patented it in 1781 patented means he had the whole soul authority of this design now he has a friend matthew bolton he also manufactured this steam engine but at that time as i said people were very cautious about buying it so there were no buyers only if you see the beginning of a 19th century 321 only 321 steam engines were all over the england all over the england 18 in cotton industry 9 in wool industry and rest in mining canal works and iron works that is steam was steam engine was very important uh, improvement or you can say development or innovation but still people were not very keen at that time this is a spinning factory if you see that how these giant wheels just by steam powered they are moving and they are creating lot of um, threads here so what we uh, conclude over this discussion right now is this this part is machine operator uh, most of the people traditional craftsmen and laborers were there and machine operators were also there but most things were going not on that pace but the pace was very gradual hand labor and steam power so let me just first tell you about the summary that is the importance of hand labor introduction of uh, machines required large capital investment 
therefore the cheap labor was preferred over the use of machines and manual labor was also preferred in the industries where production fluctuated with the seasons so goods with intricate design and specific shapes were in great demand in the european markets and this was possible only with hand labor and not machine outputs also the aristocrats and the bro that is the victorian britain and big people they preferred the refined and carefully handmade products machine made goods were for the colony people so let me take you to the detail of this that is victorian britain so what does this victorian britain means when queen victoria was the queen was a ruler you can say so from uh, 1837 uh, to 1901 the period is called as victorian victorian britain so here as i just said that uh, the machine were introduced and because of the machine being introduced still the machines were not being used so much cheap labor was preferred over the use of machines because there were plenty of labor the wages were low then coming to the seasonal job manual labors were preferred in the industries where the production fluctuated with the seasons if you see that certain for example if you take christmas so only before the christmas the binding printers they require the labor otherwise they were just doing the nothing that is why the industrialists usually preferred hand labor and employing workers for the season so this is a picture here is a picture of people on the move because all were searching for some or the other work one more thing was the products there are certain products which can only be made by hand labor everything cannot be made by machines and machines can only make make many things means one thing many time right one thing many time but if you want some intricate design some special designs and some special shapes then hand labor was required i will give an example that in britain at that time in mid 19th century 500 varieties of hammer see 500 varieties of hammer and 45 kind of axes were made and they required skill human hand skill not the mechanical technology at that time if you see this picture worker in an iron works so the worker were being idolized they were shown as uh, the you know they were suffering hardship and pain and for the nation for the cause of nation for the country they were doing this this is what is being shown in the pictures again in uh, that period victorian britain the upper class as i said that the upper class the arist aristocrat and bureau that is bureau uh, this uh, they means bureau bureau means uh, people with finesse and class so they wanted things or they wanted things which are quite refined and they have a class so they needed things made by hand that is hand labor and the machine made goods were for whom for export to the colonies so this question may be asked that the machine made goods at uh, victorian britain british time for this was made for whom and this was this was made for the colonies so uh, you know in britain because there were no shortage of uh, human hands if you talk about america they have they were using machines because the labor were less there were less there the life of the workers so let me tell you the summary first that large scale migration to towns and cities from countryside in search of jobs were seen at that time and many job seekers had to wait weeks spending nights and under bridges or in night shelters so worker become jobless after the busy season of work if it got over 
and some returned to the countryside when the demand of labor in the rural areas they opened up and they you know mostly people looked for odd jobs which till the mid 19th century were difficult to find and the fear of unemployment made worker hostile to the introduction of new technology new machines so women uh, women who survived on hand spinning they started or they began protesting when the spinning jenny was introduced so that, as i just said that because labor was too much life of the workers were what we need to understand what was the life of the workers if you see this is a picture of houseless houseless and hungry people there are kids there are women they are just waiting because britain is very cold britain is a british uh, people you know they live in very hostile condition as far as the seasons are concerned it's too cold there most of the year so but the workers were there and they were it was very difficult for them to find the job they need to they have to spend the nights under these bridges and and also uh, in night shelters they also take refuge some night refuge some were private some were maintained by the government season also because season once uh, the season was over they only get a job in a season once they the job is over they again come back to the streets so it, it was very difficult job you know they just do some odd job at that time and if you see here spinning jenny was introduced i'll just talk about this but before that one more thing need to be understood that by the early 19th century it was indeed that the salary money or the wages were increasing but if the money is increasing you cannot say that the worker level was also increasing if you go back to the napoleonic war if you see that the people were getting money but the inflation was quite high that means the prices of commodities were very high so if they were getting say 100 uh, dollars i am just get taking an example 100 dollars and uh, previously they were making their ends meet by say spending 80 dollars but now if they are getting 120 dollars the commodities are coming in 170 dollars or 180 dollars so they are not able to cope up with that so this has to be understood if you see that like the 1830s the proportion of uh, unemployment it went to, to between 35 to 75% in different regions of this place which we are talking about so 10% of the urban population in the mid century uh, mid 19th century were extremely poor extremely poor and then this spinning jenny came spinning jenny it was devised by james hargreaves James Hargreaves in 1764 so you have to learn this the spinning jenny was devised by or is being made by or invented by you can say by James Hargreaves in 1764 and this machine was speeding up the process that is machine speeded up the process of spinning and also it reduced the labor demand that is by just turning one single wheel or a worker just single worker could set up a motion in motion a number of spindles and spin several threads at the same time so this spinning jenny because employ unemployment was there fear of unemployment was there so you know people also started attacking these new machines mostly women mostly women did that so this is a picture of a shallow underground railway being constructed in central london so people started getting job how by the 1840s the cities were being uh, being made that is building activity was going on so roads were widened new railway stations came up railway lines tunnel being dug drainage and sewers laid rivers being embanked that is how people they got job so the number of workers employed in just transport industry if you take an example it it doubled in 1840s and again doubled that is it becomes become this double of the double in uh, again next coming 30 years so these were the life of uh, 
the, the place or you can say the people who were there as laborers. Now coming to the industrialization in the colonies, let me just give you an idea of the age of Indian textile then we, we, then we go to the details. So the age of Indian textiles before, before the you can say uh, age of machine, silk, silk and cotton goods from India dominated the international textile market. Armenian and Persian merchants, they could, they took jobs or, uh, you know, goods or stuffs from Punjab to Afghanistan, Eastern Persia and uh, Central Asia. Surat on Gujarat coast connected India to the Gulf and the Red Sea ports and Masuli Patnam on the Koromandal coast and Hooghly in Bengal had trade links with the South Asian, Southeast Asian ports. So, a variety of Indian merchants and traders were involved in this network of export trading, uh, financing production, carrying goods and supplying exporters. So, they gave advances to the viewers, procured the woven cloth from weaving villages and carried the supply to the ports. The European companies gradually gained power and monopoly rights and trade through the new ports of Calcutta, now Kolkata and Mumbai came to be controlled by the European companies. So, this is what happened. So, as I said that uh, before the age of machines that is industrialization etc, silk and cotton from India, they dominated the textile market and these were going from various you know people were taking the merchants like Armenian and Persian, they were taking the goods from Punjab to Afghanistan, Eastern Persia and, and Central Asia and various uh, mountain passes and deserts were used as the path. Also the sea trade was also going on operated through the main pre-colonial ports. This is very important to understand that this Surat, Surat we are talking about in Gujarat and Masuli Patnam, these are the pre-colonial ports means before the British people actually got hold of our country and let me show you. So this is the Indian, this is the place we are talking about uh, the Masuli Patnam in the Koromandal, Koromandal coast and Hooghly in Bengal. They were trading with Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian ports, whereas the Gujarat, here is we have Gujarat, this, this is the Gujarat area. So, Surat was there and this, this uh, was connected to the Gulf and Red Sea ports. So, these are the places where the pre-colonial, you can say trade was going on. And the variety of Indian merchants, means the Indian traders and merchants, they were also a part of this trade. They were financing the production, also this carrying the goods and also supplying the exporters. They, they would give advances, that is money in, uh, in prior to viewers. They would procure the woven cloth from the viewing village, they proper go to the village and take out, take out the cloth and then they would supply to the port and the negotiation after the negotiation they, they finally it goes out for the export. But uh, by the 1750s the previous uh, trade which was controlled mainly by the Indian merchants this was breaking down because the European companies were gaining power. They were gaining power. First they just secured some concessions from the local you can say rulers or courts and then they got the monopoly rights to trade for a particular trade they got the monopoly and after that the Surat and Hooghly these ports just got declined and after that what happened Surat and Masuli Patnam they lost their their uh, you can say the charm and the number says that that 16 million it was being, you know, say trading was going on at Surat. By 1740s, it just got down to 3 million. So, this is what happened to Surat and other ports which were pre-colonial and held by Indian, Indian merchants. But uh, while this Surat and Hooghly was decaying or they were 
losing their charm for trading because colonial people were there now bombay and calcutta they grew they grew and these ports these oh, these ports were held by european companies and the ships were also the european ones and this is how the old trading collapsed and the network also you know it collapsed and finally it was taken over by the european companies you can say now the question arises but let me show you the picture this is the english factory of a surat this is a 17th century drawing but we need to understand that okay this was going on this is about the trading but what was going on with the artisans the people the the viewer actually so the viewers what happened to viewers let me just give you an idea about them first the east india company gained monopoly rights over the indian textile trade it tried to eliminate the existing traders and brokers connected with the cloth trade and established direct control over the viewers the paid servant called the gumashta was appointed for supervising weavers collecting supply and examining the quality of cloth the company prevented the viewers from dealing with other buyers so once the order was placed the viewers were given loans for purchasing raw materials for the production and the produced cloth was to be handed over to whom gumashta the new gumashta had no social link with the village they acted arrogantly marched into village with sepoys and peons and punished viewers for delays in the supply and the price received by viewers from the company was miserably low it was very it was very low and the loans that they had accepted they tied them to the company so in carnatic and bengal viewers uh, they actually the you know they deserted the village and they just migrated and viewers began refusing loans also and closing down their workshops and taking to the agriculture labor so what we want to highlight here is that now the east company east india company the british company it got hold over the textile exports now so the uh, textile exports declined initially they they wanted see textile exports were very good in india but east india company they don't want to decline they don't want to uh, do it because it was in their favor or their profit to still expand the textile exports from india so what they did this uh, as i said before the political power they didn't have bengal and carnatic carnatic as their power they didn't had those places so they had all the problems of getting the regular supply also the french the portuguese they were also in the trading uh, business at that time so this is how they they were you know they were finding some problem but when east india company got hold of this these two areas they got monopoly or they got monopoly Uh, right to trade now so they don't want to uh, directly control or in between people like the merchants traders all these they don't want they did what they directly tried to target the people or the viewers who are making it they just try to eliminate the traders and brokers and they just try to establish a direct link with the viewer for that they appointed certain people who or you can say play paid servant they were called as gumashtas what is the work of gumashtas they will supervise the viewers they will collect the supplies and they will examine the quality of cloth right so what are the steps they took we are taking that means how did they they actually got hold of these business first is they appointed gumashta and then they were giving advances they were giving advances to the viewers now view, the viewers they were generally poor they were getting advances and they are making product they are they were getting the raw materials also so when they are they were getting all these they the gumashta those the person who came there 
he actually took uh, control of various things and because the loan was already given the viewers were actually tied they cannot sell their content or whatever they have made to any other because they were getting raw materials on money also from companies and gumashta were, were people who are taking care of they were supervising things but the problem was that the gumashtas were not from the they were not having they were not from the they were just paid servants like like uh, some they're doing some job so they were not from the villages those traders and uh, you know brokers which we talked about they were they were from the villages from where this weaver belong so they will uh, in bad times and good times they will they were with these viewers or the village people but the gumashtas were something different they if the work is not done properly they will come and they will beat them they will beat and flog them see this is written here and they they means there was not there was not a good relationship between the gumashtas and the viewers or people who are in this textile business in the village so sipahi means sipahi it's like you know sipahi the british pronounce sipahi as sipahi so there were as we said that this was going on people now they were getting very less wage amount the the final product which they give back to the company or the gumashtas the amount they were getting was very less and it was very difficult for them to make their end meet so they just you know uh, stop living in that uh, village and they just left the village and they took to the agricultural labor this is what they did but now in the by the turn of 19th century cotton weavers they were facing new set of problems what are these problems let us understand manchester comes to india what is what does this this mean this is this is what happened here the in 1772 henry patulo he said that indian textile is so good the demand is so high that it is no never this export of indian textile it is never going to decline or reduce but if you see in the beginning of 19th century there was a decline of textile exports from india if i give give you the numbers the number says that in 1811 to 12 that is in this uh, two years the peas goods accounted for 33% of indian exports and by 1850 to 51 it got down to 3% so this what happened someone said that it is not not it is never going to decline but it happened so the question arises is why does this happen what are the implication why does this happen the thing was british textile in india or you can say the manchester manchester comes to india so let me give you an idea about this first is the british uh, industrialist they pressurized the government they pressurized the government and why they pressurized the government to impose duties on cotton textiles so that manchester goods sell in britain without any outside competition first thing is this then the industrialized also persuaded the east india company for selling the british manufacturers or manufacturers what is being produced in britain should be uh, sent to indian markets and the exports of british cotton goods increased dramatically in the early 19th century the export market of the indian cotton weavers collapsed and the local market shrank being glutted with cheap manchester imports so the viewers could not get sufficient supply of good quality raw cotton and viewers in india were starved of supplies and forced to buy raw cotton at very high prices exorbitant prices and by the end of 19th century factories in india began production flooding the market with machine made goods and that is how the viewing industry ultimately decayed and died 
so this is what happened first of all why british uh, or you can say british export or indian textile export declined first of all the the industrial or industries when it, it came up in england the lobby they pressurized the government of uh, britain to stop the cotton import from india and also they said that okay whatever whatever is being produced here should be they pressurized east india company also that whatever is being produced here you should send it or uh, make india as the market so there was if you see virtually at the end of 18th century there had been virtually no import of cotton piece goods into india if i take the number by 1850 cotton piece goods constituted 31% of indian imports but by the 1870s this was over 50% now there was one more problem as i just uh, you know indicated that because it, because uh, things were coming from manchester or england and uh, these imports were cheap also and uh, the quality was quality was also good so the indian weavers could not compete with them they could not compete with them by 1860s again there was another problem that they were not getting enough, enough supply of the raw material that is weavers who were who were making these uh, say the final the initial things for the final cloth they were not getting what they were not getting the enough uh, supply of uh, the cotton raw cotton why because civil war broke out and cotton supplies from the us were cut off so britain did what britain wanted britain was not getting the the raw material from uh, us so britain started getting the raw materials from india so when india was sending all the raw materials the cost or the price of raw material raw cotton in india or in our region it got very higher so this viewer cannot pay that they have to buy it for very very higher prices very higher prices then the indian also indian uh, industries also started production and then these uh, you know machine goods were being were being all over uh, flooding the market you can say so the viewing is at that time become very different next come is factories the factories come up so we are talking about india so let me tell you what happened in 1854 first cotton mill in bombay came up so you can say first cotton mill in bombay present day mumbai then in 1855 the first jute mill jute mill came up and another one later in 1862 1860s the elgin milk uh, the elgin mill elgin is a kind of a uh, stone like marble so elgin mill it started in kanpur then in 1861 the first cotton mill of ahmedabad was set up so first cotton mill for ahmedabad then in 1874 the first spinning and weaving mill of madras it began production now the question arises that these factories were being set up in india who were financing it and from where does the money coming from capital coming from so we need to talk about the early entrepreneurs here is the picture two pictures let me show you then i'll go to the detail of them these two picture shows the first one is jamshed ji g g bhai so he was the son of parsi viewer and he was involved in the china trade and shipping he owned a large fleet of ships but because of the competition from english and american shippers he actually sold 
uh, his ships by the 1850s. Here we have one more entrepreneur, Dwarkanath Tagore, and he believed that India would develop through westernization and industrialization. So he invest, invested in shipping, shipbuilding, mining, banking, plantations, and insurance. So let me let me give you the idea of the early entrepreneurs. So the British in India began exporting opium to China and took tea from China to England. This was the triangular trade they were doing. So many Indians participated in this trade by providing finance. They were giving finance. Indians were giving finance, procuring supplies and also shipping the consignments. In Bengal, Dwarkanath Tagore, the picture shows, made his fortune in the China trade and established six, six joint stock companies in the 1830s and 1840s. In Mumbai, in Mumbai, Parsis, Parsis, uh, the name of Dinsha Petit and Jamshedji, uh, Nusarwanji, Tata, they built huge industrial empires in India and they accumulated their initial wealth partly from export to China and partly from raw cotton shipments to England. The others like uh, the merchants from Madras traded, they traded with Burma and uh, Middle East and East Africa. There were other trading uh, were also going on. So the other trading activities included carrying goods from one place to another, banking, transferring of uh, the funds between cities and financing the traders. But Indian traders were bad. They were bad from trading with Europe in manufactured goods. And they had to export raw materials and food grains required by the British. And they were also gradually they were edged out of the shipping business, the Indians. So, you know, all these were going on. So, question arises is, where did the worker came from? So, the crux is that all the worker, mostly they came from the vicinity, wherever the mill or production is going on. So, in most industri industrial regions, worker came from the nearby districts only. If you see, the the with the expansion of factories, factories needed workers. In 1901, 1901, there were 5,84,000 workers in Indian factories. 1946, the number was over 24,36,000. So they came from the nearby district. And the job seekers were always more than the jobs available at that time. So industrialists employed a jobber. There was a jobber. Let me show you. Here is a symbolic picture of a jobber. This is a head jobber and his posture and cloth, it shows what he is wearing, what is the position, authority and the power he had at that time. So industrialists, they, apply, they employ the jobbers for getting new recruits and these jobbers were what? They were the, you can say, very close to or very old and trusted worker of the of the you can say the person who held that business so in this industrial life the employment of these jobber were done by Indian industrialists and these were getting these jobbers were getting new recruits so the they got people from their village ensured them the job these jobbers they ensured them the job like ensured them job and helped them to settle in the city wherever they are coming and provided them with money also when the the people are in crisis but there were some uh, peculiarities also of industrial growth if you see this is the spinners at work in Ahmedabad mill mostly women were doing work in the spinning departments so as I just mentioned, what were the peculiarities, specialities or different things about the industrial growth? 
The European managing agencies established tea and coffee plantations acquiring land at cheap rates from the colonial governments. So they also invested in mining the indigo, indigo and jute. Since the yarn, the yarn was not an important part of British imports in India, the early cotton mills in India produced very coarse cotton yarn rather than fabric. And the yarn produced in Indian spinning mills were used by the weavers of uh, India, handloom weavers of India, or they were exported to China. So that was that was the yarn being prepared by India or Indian people, and they they were the market was Indian weavers only, and I, or they were exported to China. And here we see nationalists during the Swadeshi movement. They mobilize people to boycott the foreign cloth, and this reduced this reduced the the use of that also, right? Industrial groups organize themselves to protect their collective interests, pressurizing the government to increase tariff protection and grant other concessions. This also happened at that time, and uh, from 1906. the export of indian yarn to china it declined since what the japanese the japanese were there and japanese mill they flooded the chinese market in 1919-12 cotton this is at this time cotton piece goods production in india doubled and with with british mills busy in the production of war products so they were busy with war production to meet the needs of the army the manchester imports manchester imports to india it declined it got down and because the war people just thought that it will be end by the christmas of 1914 but it prolonged so indian factories were also were called upon to supply the war needs so they were making all the things like uh, jute bags they were making cloth for army uniforms and tents and and leather boots and horse and mule saddles and host of other things so industrial production boomed owing to the increase in the working hours and the establishment of new factories and if you see unable to unable to modernize and compete with the us germany and japan the british economy then crumbled after the war so cotton production collapsed uh, we are talking about britain at that time and exports of cotton cloth from britain it fell really dramatically and within the colonies the local industries as we just saw in, in india the local industries they substituted the foreign manufacturers and also captured the home market finally so what was happening in the small scale industries this is a hand uh, woven cloth so this there is very you know intricate designs if you say hand woven cloth this could not be copied easily by mills so large industries form here large industries form only a small segment segment of the economy if you just if you understand that if the industries has come up then it will just take over all the small businesses it was not like that most of them were located in mumbai and bengal most of the workers worked in small workshops very small workshops uh, gully workshops and household units means in units were there were in their houses only so while these cheap machines made thread wiped out the spinning industry in 19th century but the weavers still survived and handlooms handlooms cloth production expanded steadily between this year 1900 and 1940 it it this, this happened now the question arises that these small scale industries they didn't die they were there so how does this happen this is because of some inventions you know peep the viewers they were adopting the technological changes like the fly shuttle fly shuttle this is a mechanical device used for viewing 
moved by means of ropes and pulleys and it places the horizontal threads called the weft into the vertical threads called the warp the invention of the fly shuttle it actually made uh, it possible for the viewers to operate large looms and view wide piece of cloth so this can be done at that time so this is how it st still uh, survived so among weavers some produced coarse cloth while other wore fine variety varieties the coarse cloth was bought by the poor if you see here the coarse means they were producing all types of cloth and they have markets for them also the coarser cloth was bought by the poor and the demand fluctuated violently along the along with the fluctuation of their incomes and the finer ones were bought by the rich and the demand was constant because if you see the banarsi and baluchari uh, sarees the demand did, was always there banarsi baluchari sarees are like those sarees which has all the mythological stories being uh, crafted on it so this happened at that time this is the picture showing location of large scale industries in india and the size of the circle shows uh, this indicates the amount of industries they have so bengal bengal region was having the highest then mumbai then we have this uh, uttar pradesh or uttar provinces united provinces in madras somewhere here somewhere here punjab also so this this was the distribution at that time the market for goods when the production is there if something is being produced there has to be a market so these are the some of some of uh, the advertisement pictures which showing that how the products are being being advertised that is see made in manchester if something is coming from manchester it was being uh, sold with a label and along with that they have picture of indian mythological uh, you can say scenarios or pictures or symbols so people were forced to do or they were glued that okay we should buy this and we should really buy all these so that we are doing good for our country so market for goods new consumers were created through advertisements and advertisements it expanded here if you see it expanded uh, the markets for products and shaped new consumer culture as i suggested here the label the label was needed for making the name and the place of the manufacturer and the name of the company familiar to the buyer like this manchester then images of indian god and goddesses if you see here were imprinted on goods for making a foreign product familiar to the indian masses and calendars 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 are very important because if you put a calendar on your wall you are going to see it for whole year so the calendars were used immensely for the advertisement and figures of important uh, persons uh, and goddesses and various other which can connect the the masses were advertised on these calendars and advertisement became a vehicle of the nationalist message of swadeshi at that time so this is all we learned in this topic that the industry is boomed and how it happened in britain how it happened in uh, the colonial era in india and how the different different uh, stakeholders like the industrialists like the government and like the viewers etc like the workers how the life uh, went on with these this historical period so this is all about this topic thank you so much take care of yourself